places. And uh, so I'm going to give you an example of a big data application, uh, location-based big data application that doesn't involve a large space. It involves a space the size of a factory. So one of the techniques that's being developed, one of the sets of tools that's being developed at the Collaboration Laboratory at Wollongong University is uh, a high-definition camera. It's a standard Canon high-end camera on a steady mount, a steady cam mount. I don't know whether you've seen any of those. These are sort of spring-loaded arms that, uh, uh, and a vest. A cameraman, cameraman or camera person wears the vest with the camera and the vest actually takes out all the movement from the walking, otherwise you end up being quite sick <laughs> to the resulting video. And uh, the, the location-based information comes from a sensor, an X-sense sensor, located on the camera, and that determines the pan, tilt, and zoom of the camera. It also determines its location indoor. And this is enough information to be able to reconstruct well, if you imagine, it's big data because each one of those frames, 1 25th of a second, high def frames, each one of them has got these time stamps, these location stamps, these pan, tilt, and zoom stamps. And when you feed that into software such as Photomodeler, which is a, a, a Canadian product, you can reconstruct a digital twin of what you've just seen. So imagine a camera person walking through factory floor, literally creating, as they go, a digital twin of what they see. And that digital twin is a fully three-dimensional uh, model, a complex model, that shows actually how the factory is organized, not what managers presume the factory is, is, <laughs> is but actually what is going on in that, uh, how that uh, space is arranged. And then that can be input to a simulation uh, environment that enables you to measure, for example, capacity, workflow, to redesign where machinery are to increase the optimal flow of processing through the plant. So this is a, an example of uh, big data, small space. We usually think of big data happening over geographical space, but it doesn't need to be that at all. So that's just <laughs> one uh, thing, uh, one example. Um, I want to cover three projects that have actually happened. Uh, well, one of them is still being developed, and that's number three. But um, the other two have actually been published and uh, 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 have been uh, talked about quite a bit. And they involve the application of not just location, but also semantics. And by semantics, we mean meanings, literally. Uh, and of course, if we think about social media, social media is probably the penultimate, or uh, well, the ultimate, uh, uh, form of semantics, uh, if, you, if you like, because here we have potentially location, if we've got a geolocation turned on, uh, but we also have a range of potential meanings if we know how to process the media. I'm going to concentrate primarily on language because that's really the most nuanced kind of media we can deal with. It's also the hardest to process. Usually when you talk to engineers about looking at social media, what they do is they try and find the shortest cut <laughs> to implementing a system which doesn't involve looking at the semantics of the messages. It involves trying to see how much information we can get, how much we can exclude, and so on. I've worked on a project like this, an emergency project called Pet Jakarta. If there's any people that come from Indonesia, you may be aware of this because this was an actual real system uh, rolled out to provide flooding information to citizens of Jakarta. You know that monsoons go through Jakarta quite regularly. So, uh, so often you ended up with huge flooding, huge inundation, huge cooling, and a disrupted city. So Peta Jakarta was a web app that enabled uh, people to send off their messages saying it's flooded here, and that would show up on a web app, they could see that, and then you know they could see their messages. This system was a great system because it was actually used by BP which is the flooding agency, in uh, the emergency agency in Jakarta. The problem, however, was that what was being done with social media. So what was being done with social media was uh, each of the messages were being filtered for flooding, inundation, cooling, in both English and Bahasa. 
And so literally, everything that uh, uh, didn't have those words in it was excluded. Now that's a problem. So I had a, a beautiful example. It was actually a, an image sent by uh, a woman who was caught in a car. There was floodwaters outside the car. She took a photograph outside the window, and you can see the floodwaters, and the, the text was, still like this. Still like this. Of course, this was a flooding message, and it was actually, you couldn't process that image and got a height of the, of the flood water. But in fact, actually, that was an excluded message because it didn't match any of the textual uh, filtering that was going on. So literally, this changed me to start thinking about how do we process these messages, social media messages. They're location-based, so they're useful, but how do we process them semantically? And so we started to develop this idea about spatial semantics. And here's some examples of it being used. So the first one is uh, uh, geolocated uh, go-along interview. So a go-along interview is when I talk with an interviewee and we're walking somewhere or we're driving somewhere or we're being, or we're on public transport somewhere. So geolocated go-along interview conducted with elderly and disabled uh, citizens. We're using bus service, so we're studying a bus service. And uh, what we're using is a particular kind of language resource called appraisal. And appraisal is how we encode emotion, judgment, or appreciation into language. And we can look for that, we know that resource. And so uh, what we did was we took the transcripts, we know where we were when we said what we said, and we can extract the emotion or the judgment or the appreciation or not of the particular event at a point in time. And we can, we can actually uh, plot that on a map. And this is important. Why, why do we look at the crazy? Why are we looking at this? Because actually, if you're elderly or if, you, if you're infirmed, it's really important to know that the experience that you have of something as mundane as a bus trip is completely different for someone with these conditions. If you've got diabetes type 2, and a lot of people are going to get it when they, they start getting elderly, they have stability problems. So getting on and off a bus is a big deal. Having a bus driver that breaks real hard just before you get to a bus mm -hmm. stop means, and I've seen this happen, I've seen elderly people get thrown inside a bus. I actually saw that quite recently. It was like horrifying to see. And people who are visually impaired who use public transport, so we did a big study in Stockholm with uh, CTF, Centre for Services uh, Research, which is a major uh, uh, player in service science and service scape and all that, all that literature. Half of it comes from Bittner in the US and the other bit comes from Sweden. That's where that services uh, research centre is. And this particular study was in Stockholm of visually impaired and uh, uh, also to say other, other kinds of disability uh, people. And here's an example of, I think this guy was called Ralph, actually. Uh, so he's blind, he's trying to get onto, he's trying to get to a particular office in Stockholm. Stockholm is a busy city and he's experiencing fear. The reason why he's experiencing fear at particular points along that bus transport route is because he has to get on or off a bus to, to get to a train and in order to do so he has to cross a really busy freeway. Can you imagine? So this guy's got elevated fear going on. Right? So we wanted to study the tra this transport system from the perspective of these people's experience. Why? Because we may be able to redesign it. So by knowing this kind of location-based data, by connecting it to people's lived experience, we can actually design better systems. So this is a part of a joint study that was done between SARMOF, Services and Marketing Oriented Transport Unit, and me. And uh, we did a similar thing. Um, this is actually Northfields Avenue. It's hard to see. This is done with ArcGIS. We probably would have liked to have done it with QGIS, right? which you'll be using in a minute. It's an open source tool. But this is a sort of a candy stripe representation. The red is high levels of affect. 
So this is like here. So this is uh, 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 one particular route done by an elderly person. And that road is Northfields Avenue. That red bit coincides with a bus stop on Northfields Avenue. So we can do this candy stripe kind of representation. So this is a, uh, the study was called the Transport Journey Appraisal Study, we're using the appraisal system. But it's an example of looking at location and trying to match up people's experience, probably based on uh, an analysis of language for the most part. Here's one that was uh, uh, horrendous. This is uh, um, the Sydney siege, which was uh, 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 led to dead hostages, a dead, uh, um, well, we're not sure whether they were, I don't think they were a terrorist, I think they were just. Uh, a nutcase. A nutcase, yes, that might be a, uh, an understatement. But yeah, uh, certainly uh, someone with murderous intent. And uh, what we wanted to do was to look at the appraisal associated with, uh, again, we wanted to look at the emotion associated with uh, the tweets that were coming out. There was an enormous number of tweets. We didn't gather them. The Germans, our German colleagues, gathered them because they had uh, uh, all these this social media observatory which they just spun up and then suddenly this happened. So we were able to get all the tweets. And then we developed, uh, we had uh, a particular young Germans, it turned out, a uh, uh, programming student who did the most beautiful world interface for us. And you uh, can't really see it because, you know, things up. But here are all the different uh, uh, categories. And we'll talk about this in, in a minute. Uh, so different kinds of levels of affect, emotion, uh, judgment, and uh, appraisal. And here is a storyline. So this is uh, literally um, the sequence of events as described from the media so that we can get a timeline. And this enabled us to actually match up uh, the tweets and the geolocators so and see where they're coming from. And we saw a whole bunch of really interesting things related to this. Firstly, we were able to see the development of a particular kind of staging in the emotion associated with this particular uh, incident. So we initially saw a whole bunch of uh, disbelief, fear, so affect. Then as it became clear what was going on for, for a long time, there really wasn't an understanding of what was happening. There was high levels of appreciation, and I don't mean they liked it, I mean they understood what was going on. So there was high levels of appreciation, so like, oh, we're in a, this is not just some sort of you know incident with a gas bottle blowing up or something, this is actually a terrorist event, or an attempted terrorist event. And then later, uh, we saw, um, a whole bunch of judgment being made. And the, the, there was uh, uh, an amount of racism associated with the tweets that were coming, and its opposite. There was an enormous outpouring of emotion for uh, uh, people, people who were uh, Muslims, uh, people who were Arabic speakers. There was uh, 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 a worldwide hashtag went around yeah, uh, yes, um, uh, because, because the, the important thing was to actually show sympathy to, to uh, people who uh, this person didn't represent. We actually saw a lot of this in the, in the tweets in this representation. We saw the reaction that countries outside of Australia had dis displaced in terms of time. So, you know, sort of half a day later, suddenly, whoop, you know, the, the Germans are reacting to what we had already seen or the Europeans were reacting to what we had already seen. This is, uh, this is an example of flooding in Jakarta. Um, this is not all negative. But, um, this is an example of a person who's figured out a way of making a buck out of it. So uh, this person actually escorts other people. And you notice this guy's on the phone. <laughs> so say, gee, it's flooding you. Or somebody's actually dragging you through the flood water. Um, this sort of stuff you see is a sort of a resilient, I see this as a resilience uh, uh, response. Uh, so I don't see this as a bad thing, although this guy looks like he could use a break. <laughs> He's probably been doing that all morning. Um, so one of the things that we wanted to look at was we take these tweets, this came out of the Peter Jakarta project, and then we look at a particular system in language called transitivity. This is how we encode experience into and it works out that there's only really seven ways we can experience anything. We can think something, 
we can behave in a way, we can speak, and so on. Seven of them. So it might seem at, one, at some point to be a terrible thing to say that all of our human experience can be categorised into these seven types, but unfortunately that's in fact true. Together, also, there are 13 circumstances. It's another little system in language. This involves where something happens, when something happens, how long something happens for. All of the circumstances associated with thinking, feeling, and so on. Right? And so what we end up with is a space which is enormous. 91 different experience dimensions can be produced out of this. 91 of them. So when you crack open QGIS and imagine 91 layers, <laughs> that's what we're talking about. Of course, QGIS enables you to collapse them and hide them and show them. Yeah, the Photoshop of uh, geographical information systems, uh, each one of those would be on layers. Can you imagine the kind of processing we can do? We can say, who is acting? Who is actually doing something materially? That's a process nearby this location, and then show that on a map. That could be all the people running away from some disaster, or, or doing something about a disaster that's happening. Depends on what it was that you were actually, um, you know, what, what the theme was of the particular tweet. And so this is the sort of thing that we're working on now. It's complicated. Can I give you, can I show you how it works, all right? So here's an actual tweet. Pata Jakarta, that's the system that the tweet came through. Mm -hmm. It's flooding around here, I'm not going to leave. Hashtag Pangea. Mm -hmm. Right. Why, that, that doesn't make any sense. Normally, if something was happening to me, if I was flooding, you know what I'd be doing? I'd be running away from it. In Australia, we have bushfires, we run away from those bushfires, we do not hang around. Why does that make sense? Because this tweet is coming out of a region right next to a river. That river is in flood. And those settlements where the, people, where the person is living are illegal. And so what happens is those people stay in their place. They go up, actually, because they're multi multiple stories high. So as the flood level dries, they sacrifice lower levels of the house and move up uh, to higher levels in the house. And they stay there looking after their own property and the property of their uh, fellows, their fellow neighbours, because they're afraid the police will come in and break them, because it's a good opportunity to get rid of them. I'm suspecting you know about this. Whereabouts do you come from? Yeah, ah! Yeah. Great. <laughs> what an appropriate... <laughs> so, do we have a laser? Yes, we do. So, here's how we actually pass this. This verb here, we're looking for verbs, we're looking for processes, so we're looking for flooding. So flooding is a material process, that means something physically happening. Mm -hmm. So we're looking for that material process, flooding, that's important in a flood system, right? Okay. And then we're looking for a circumstance, that circumstance around here, that's a location, around here. So we literally can actually draw a, a circle around what around here might be, uh, maybe, uh, you know, four or five or six uh, uh, properties surrounding a particular point we're dealing with. This is, a, this is one message. Here's another message. I'm not going to leave. Leave is a behavioural process. So here we have in one tweet two entirely different datums, if you like, or sets of attributes you want to, you want to talk about. Two entirely separate attributes relating to the same location, right? So you can now see that language is an incredibly dense uh, way of expressing experience, and you can actually map experience. So here's a little simulation. Perhaps uh, this should be um, really. Perhaps this should be um, points. Doesn't matter. You get the idea. In a process map about material processes, here's some absent data points, but there's a lot of activity either side of that structure. And that could be because that's where the flooding is and there's no tweets coming out of it. Unless the people are tweeting and holding their phone up above water. Right? So this is a way of potentially being able to draw 
draw maps of flooding. 